If you're looking for philosophy, I'm the wrong person. Uh, I'm an empiricist, a PhD by training, and everything I did was experiential. Uh, and so it's, it's been um, an interesting journey. I, the quick, quick story is I was coming into graduate school, walking down the hill towards campus, working on my PhD, and I could see epiphanously that, in fact, there was a lot of unhappiness. I had been a lot of, through a lot of crap by my late 20s. I'd suffered a lot uh, in all kinds of ways. And uh, I could see this endless narrative going on inside. It just would not stop. And if I watched it carefully, I could see that that was the problem, I believed. And so I said, well, I'm going to stop that, or try to. I didn't know it was possible. I didn't know if it had ever been done before. Uh, if anybody had told me what the likelihood of success was, I wouldn't have started. <laughs> but I was started anyway. And so I just went down that path. I was reading uh, a Zen poem on the administration lawn at lunchtime. It was the barn bag lunch. And the uh, world opens up for half an hour, 45 minutes, into a space I'd never seen before. And most importantly, there were no thoughts. It was very quiet, very still. And it just went on, and then it stopped. I thought, this is great. I turned the book over. I read one line of a poem. Turned the book over. It had Zen on the cover. At the time, I couldn't even spell Zen. And so the idea was, well, these Zen guys somehow have found a way to stop thoughts. And so I'm going to be a Zen guy. So I went off to be a Zen guy. Uh, and I worked with two Rinzai Zen masters for off and on. Uh, I had a full-time job. Bishop in graduate school, uh, national laboratory, industry, the academia, a process, many different things. At the same time, I kept doing two hours of practice every day. I did self-inquiry. Uh, luckily for me, the little tiny koan book, the Daibosatsu Zendo, which is a very koan-based uh, practice, uh, had an interesting piece by Basui. Basui's Dharma talk on one mind. 14th century, 12th, 12th, 14th century Zen monk, Japanese, who started asking questions like, where am I, who am I, when am I, what is this? The other, guy, other option at Daibusata Zendo was to do the traditional koans. What's the sound of one hand clapping? What was your, your face before your parents were born? Uh, does a dog have Buddha nature? Those didn't interest me. They were made up for... Korean, Japanese, and Chinese folk who spoke those languages fluently, and they were paradoxical and interesting to them. They were not paradoxical or interesting to me. So I asked Ida Roshi if I could just go ahead and do this Basui thing. This who am I, where am I, what is this? Sure. I did that. And I went off to do that. My other Zen master, Tony Packer, you may have heard of, uh, the ultimate iconoclastic Zen teacher, rose to the very top of the hierarchy of the number one Zen center in the East, arguably, at the time, Philip Kaplow's center in Rochester, and uh, walked away from it and said, no more robes, no more bells, no more whistles, no more fancy hats, no more uh, chanting of sutras. Uh, we're going to make this stripped down, bare bones, Zen, no ceremonies. And I found that really important. So I had those two parallel paths running and doing my full-time job, which was running around, flying around the world at times, uh, and just kept doing two hours every day. I did one hour of where am I, when am I. I focused on uh, where am I, because as an empirical scientist, I should know the answer to that. Now, that seemed to be very simple. I mean, how could I not know where I am? And I began searching into that, and it turned out it was not so easy. Uh, so I'd stuck with where am I and who here were my two main koans I worked with for most of the time through the course of uh, about 25 years and 20,000 hours until the page turned. And when the page turned, thoughts completely stopped. Along the way, there were lots of experiences, but my, my teachers all said, don't pay any attention to experiences. And I paid no attention to experiences. Just let go of them. I did yoga, too. Mostly, if you know yoga, flowing vinyasa yoga, a meditational style. If you know Gary Kraft's style, I'm in his book. Um, 
yoga for wellness. Um, and just a way to make yoga itself a meditative practice, continuous, flowing, focusing on the breath, focusing on what the body was doing, not so much on being perfectly aligned. So I kept those going until things stopped. Now, when it stopped, um, I was doing a yoga posture. No, I won't tell you what it was, because uh, it's, it's, it's a hard one, and if I tell people what it is, they'll try to do it, knowing people, and they'll hurt themselves. So I don't, t- I don't tell what it is. Point is, there was a yoga posture. I went up into it one way, and I came down, and it completely stopped, just like that. Not bam, because it was 25 years of this and 20,000 hours, but it was like, like this, not even that hard, just like this. It was gone. This was problematic because I had a thousand folks working for me, four research laboratories and a quarter billion dollar budget, and there was nothing going on up here. And so well, how's work going to go? This could be a really difficult day. It would also be, Hosanna, Hosanna, they'll stone me, or get all excited about me, or not, throw me out. None of it happened. I went to work, nobody even noticed. It was like, yeah, whatever. And I just went through my day. And I found out that in the course of being in the corporate world, and I was a senior vice president at the time with lots of people working for me, on the executive committee and everything else, that in fact I worked better because I was the only person in the room for the meeting. Everybody else was someplace else most of the time. 15, 30 percent, they were off someplace thinking about nobody caught the body language, the intonations. Uh, they were all running around in their heads someplace else. So before long, you get to be the smartest person in the room because nobody else knew what was going on. <laughs> and you had these creative insights came out of no place. You read exhibits, and you prepare for the meeting, you just sit there and just shut up and wait for something to happen. And you just sit there and sit there. Something would come up and you just go, blah, you just say it. <gasps> Whoa, that was so incredible. And, and so before long, you know, this, this gets to be a, a, a pattern. But this is really, you know, this works. It works big time. As you know, if you've been in corporate world, it doesn't always help to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, it, 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 it can really work against you. So, um, but it was a really a, a powerful, more useful way to operate in the world. You could be much, high, much, much better functioning with no, almost no stress whatsoever, and you just showed up prepared, but just showed up. And that's what it was from there on, on forward. It has been that way now for 20 years. So that's my macro story. And what I want to do is go through for you some of the things that might be useful to you to understand um, the cognitive neuroscience. When I started, when the page turned for me, there was no neuroscience. We just didn't have such a thing. We didn't even have, believe it or not, smartphones. We hardly even had calculators. It was that long ago, and there were pterodactyls overhead. It was that long ago. So we'll, we'll, go, we'll look at that, but there's a lot of neuroscience. Starting 2007, 8, 9, 10, a lot of neuroscience came online, and uh, I was in a lot of studies, um, one big one at Yale, that uh, made a big difference, and um, have looked, spent a lot of time looking at neuroscience. And like the one thing, if there are any neuroscience in the audiences that neuroscientists don't do, is they don't have the experience. I mean, you're talking about a transcendental experience, and you're you're, do, you're studying something you have no idea what it is. You're doing a lot of research, grabbing a lot of fMRIs or PETs, uh, scans of all sorts, talking to your peers. But in fact, you have no clue what you're talking about. You're trying to replicate this, and you've never experienced this. So the first was, well, you can't be, you can't be just a subjective reporter and have it be science. Well, you have no choice here. This is subjective experience. You've got to have the experience, or you can't really do meaningful research about it, no matter how much time you play with the neurons. So one of the big discoveries has come out fairly recently, was, some of you have heard this metaphor before, there's an elephant and a rider, okay? Conscious experience, blah, 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 is the rider. 
And this is the rider drawn to scale, right there. Okay. Okay. The rider, the rider can do six to eight pieces of data, run forty to sixty bits per second, and solve one problem at a time. There's a reason why we evolved that way. We had to. We had so much processing power. But that's what it was. This is the press secretary, uh, critic, uh, blamer, shamer. Uh, oh, you're, you're never going to fail. Your monster was no good, blah, blah, blah. It's up here talking all day long like that. Underneath this is an elephant. This is an elephant, believe it or not. The best I can do for an elephant. And that's the elephant. It's the front end. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's the elephant. Now, differential processing power between the rider and the elephant is 500,000 times. The elephant does everything. One thing our neuroscience has shown is that everything happens offline. Almost nothing happens in the rider. Press secretary, maybe talking to other, other, other riders, but everything does it offline. This, if you had to do this with a 40 bit per second processor, your hand would never move. Would never move. You have no possibility of ever understanding what's going on here. No matter how much anatomy you study, you will never be able to consciously do this process. So it's a non conscious process. And yet we do this amazing stuff. Elephant does it all. Elephant also makes all the choices. All of our choices in the course of a day are made by the elephant. It's making choices all the time. Pick up the black pen, pick up the green pen, pick up the blue pen. That process is going on continuously. And we found out that it's a really a, a decision-making process is a constituency assembly business. And what you have, I'll go to, this is, this will be the, well, this is a flip back to your chart. I had a recent blog post on self-inquiry, which is asking yourself these questions. Where am I? Who am I? When am I? What is this? And you look at this and you say, okay, how do we make choices? In general, um, there's two groups. There's a group that's against self-inquiry. There's a group that is for self-inquiry. Or anything else. It can be red pen, blue pen. There are pro and antis for each one of these things. And what happens is there's a split here. And each one of these groups, constituencies, goes out and runs around the brain and tries to grab modulars. There's a modular model. Assemble modules for their, their side. The pro side, you know, initially self-inquiry, very bad thing. So the antis are winning big time. Because you start this process, you start to go, where am I? What a stupid question that is. Okay, that's an anti. He goes out and they grab a bunch of constituencies and they assemble them. So they have a lot of antis. So any of you who have done this practice realize that pretty quickly there's a lot of resistance, a lot of pushback to making this thing go forward. There's not much positive reinforcement. Nothing's really happened. It's really troubling. It's troubling. The egos don't like this. So the pro side, almost nothing. You know, all he gets pain. This is, but these guys win. They keep win. They win. They win against the against the pros for a long time, maybe a month or two. After a month or two, then it's like, hey, you know, this does feel better. You know, I'm not as stressed as I was before. You know, this is a little constituency get assembled. But, you know, I, I'm more relaxed. I'm a little more present with people, even after like six weeks or two months. So you say, oh, this, this is good. So this, this can start to build. So what happens is the antis get worried. Oh, oh this, is not, this is not good. Because what they're going to do is they're going to really throw these, this is the egos. Eyes. And you have, you have lots of you, just a quick aside, 
There are thousands of you, certainly many hundreds of you. Uh, if you watch the sweep of the long wave uh, frequencies across the cortex of the brain, you see different franks assembled, different gyms assembled. And you can watch them change as the function changes and as you are in your relationships. If I talk to Larry, a relationship person, a Gary shows up. If I talk to Jim, another relationship shows up. Different person, those two. His sweet dual dog, if I talk to Kai, Kia. Kia. I talk to Kia, <laughs> but personality develops there. And you can see different Gary's emerge. And you can watch that in the course of a day. Just see if you go around, this is Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf said you have as many personalities as you have relationships. And that's what this is all about. I mean, relationships, you had to form evolutionarily different relationships with different people. Okay? So eventually, the pros assemble more, and they get better and better, and the ego's eyes come under a lot of attack. This is really working pretty well. You know, I'm really feeling a lot better. Yeah, it's, you know, days aren't perfect, but I that's some really good days now. I just had an aha yesterday. I want to have a, oh, oh, moment. This is good. This is good. Or, I had a, oh, whoa, oh, oh, oh. It's, okay, this is great. This is good. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of votes over here. Votes are piling up. And so over here, big resistance. No, this is not okay. They go out and find more things. They go back and they drag up anything they can find. Any old nasty story from the past. Any horrible thing you were afraid to, to, to talk about. Some kind of toxic, perhaps you were abused as a kid, thing that you just can't even go there. Just don't even think of going there. They'll say, okay, okay. You want to see this, huh? This is bad. This is good. Uh, well, it does that. Try to slow this whole process down. And the further you go in this process, the more you'll see this. This gets deeper and deeper, and more and more old, ugly stuff gets dragged up. And over here, this keeps at the same time, gets getting better and better and better. But it's this struggle back and forth between pros and cons. And the problem, the problem, but the challenge of this work is to have enough desire to push through this. To keep doing this long enough to wear all these guys down. Most people stop. And Mata Maharshi's metaphor was you have to feel like you've got your head held underwater. I was co-leader of Zen, early regional Zendo a couple of years, and we had a painting of a guy with his hair on fire in the eating area. So if you're going to go all the way over here, and wipe these guys out, it takes a lot of persistence, a lot of courage. doesn't mean you can still stop along here, but these guys will still be down there lurking. And how you can tell they're there is you have self-referential thoughts. If you've got a self-referential thought, you've got a self. You say, I don't pay attention to those thoughts. They're behind the screen. Well, no, <laughs> they're there, though. There are a lot of uh, almost uh, non-dual people who do that. Say, well, look, I, I shouldn't care so much about them. I don't worry about them. They don't bother me. Well, but you claim you're being a non-dualist. And there you are, these self-referential thoughts are over there going, blah, 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 blah. Surely you need to get rid of those. And so there's this struggle, too, is how far can you push that curve to stop all the thoughts? Well, it takes... A lot of drive to do that, but like I say, even if you only get to here on this side, it's still a fantastic experience. You may not be a prima ballerina, but you're a very damn good ballerina. Much better than you would have been if you hadn't done the process. So don't worry about so much about the end point. Just think about along the way how much better your life gets and how many more of these ahs or ahs you have in the way. So anyway, this voting goes on all the time. Okay, um, how did we get this ego I? You know, we this thing somehow came on the scene. It wasn't like it was a magical. Ta da! Um, actually, I'll tell you who did it. Who did it? 
The reason you, you're unhappy is because of Toba. Toba did it. Toba did it. Yeah, Toba did it. Toba caused you to have this I, me, my doing something to some object. Toba did it. But to, Toba is? You can't say anything. Toba, 78,000 years ago, was a mega volcano. Just kill, kill away would be just dust in the wind. Huge, massive uh, geologic event. Uh, Indonesian. Blew up and probably had, as we can tell, maybe two years of something like nuclear winter. Not completely, not nuclear winter, but it's winter. You know, darkening out the sun, much colder in most of the places where our species was. So this was really a big event. We got down, there were five hominids at the time. Five upright walking species. Us and four others. And we weren't doing so well. Uh, we got down to, and this is pretty good data, a thousand breeding pairs. Homo sapiens. A thousand breeding pairs. Not very many. So you say, well, are we going to survive because we've got four other species competing against us? And there aren't many of us around the cave. So we said, we have, we have to get organized. So what they said was, we have to find some new way to operate. And what they said, well, some of us, what if we just assign tasks? What if I say, well, Jim, you do this. Larry, you do that. Jim will go out and get the truck. And Larry will go out and get some groceries. And, and I'll go out and get something else. We'll assign tasks. To assign tasks, I've got to say, okay, Jim, you have to get this thing. And Larry, you've got to get that thing. And so then I had to draw a symbol. This is the thing we had to get. It's a box of groceries or something. I drew a symbol on the, on the wall of the cave. He said, oh, a symbol. He didn't say that. But you, we now could assign tasks, differentially assign different tasks to do a simple objective. Now if we got more and more sophisticated at this, this subject... Doing object set up gave us this ability. We could assign tasks. As we got better and better at this thing, we could assign, you know, the tribe over there has given us a little problem, and uh, we don't like them. So we're going to get you know, gang up. We're going to have like 100 people. We're going to have different tasks of how to attack them so we can, we can beat them. And we got better and better and better at this thing. We got good enough at it, we developed large hierarchies. Huge hierarchies. There is no other species on the planet that can do what we can do. Nobody else can amass a million people, assign them different tasks, that are going over and kill a million of other people of our people. <laughs> no other species can do that. Not even close. Large numbers but not in reassignment, sophisticated tasks, and keep changing the task, and keep changing what people are doing and where they're doing it. No species can do that, except us. And we mopped up the planet, for good or ill. And that's where we are right now. We've got this hierarchical structure. So to support that hierarchical structure that Toba made us do, um, we said, okay, um, we should evolve some behaviors. And over the course of roughly 60,000 years, we evolved all kinds of interesting behaviors to support this hierarchy. There had to be things like say, compassion. We had to feel compassion for other people in the hierarchy to support the hierarchy. Now, compassion, as many of you may know, is really, you know, we get dopamine rewards. If we give if I give uh, Kiki, if I give Kia a bone, in her eyes, that's good. And I have to feel good. I get the dopamine hit because I gave her, she was really hungry, and I gave her this treat, and she was happy. And I'm happy. 
She's obviously happy simply. I'm happy because I made her feel better. And so if I go around and do this, now this is really, I do it, but you know, keep it needs to, she seems to, I want a favor back in return. This is not free. This is reciprocal altruism. This is what we call compassion is really just, let's make a deal. Now, we're a sophisticated species, so we have different kinds of implied rewards, implicit timings for things to occur. We're also a species that cheats at things like reciprocal altruism. If we get the right population, we can gang up and cheat together. There's like five or six different cheating behaviors our species evolved to not follow this thing. But this has evolved into us, and we have dopamine to support it. This helped the hierarchy get stronger because we were all trading favors back and forth. The hierarchy had to make sure that if you were somebody above you in the hierarchy, that you were giving something to them, but you, know, you kind of hoped to get something back in the future, like a promotion or you know, push over another job or a higher job. And so we did this thing. We learned how to do this thing. Was, well, let's make a deal with your boss or your partner or your neighbor. You, know, you give him your Milan Moore, he just takes it and leaves. That doesn't work. You, know, you expect something back for the lawnmower loan. You know, maybe his saw or something. But some, some return. We want some payback. There's almost there's no free lunch. So you've got this structure that goes right along with this ego, I think. So, okay, this supports that. Something else you've got, another bad behavior, bad now, is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is, okay, I'm, I'm on the, the Trump side. You go out and you, just, you read things only about, only about the far right. You, know, you just keep going further and further right. And I've got some friends who are Marxist and, and about Marxist, way out here on the left. And the problem is, is that people over here only read right stuff. People over here only read left stuff. And now we know with fake news we can feed that engine, and we do. You know, we argument about how this all, where all the stuff from Russia came in, etc. But this whole idea about, yes, you can come in, and if you can just get the American people to hate each other more, then they become less powerful. And as we've lost our middle, I don't go into politics, we've, we've lost the ability to work together. And that's really deleterious, that unless you can unwind this confirmation bias, by actually, God forbid, reading the other side's stuff. Or stop reading it all together. If you're reading the news as per, pick your news source, uh, New York Times, pick, just pick it. Uh, you will find yourself on one side or the other. Unless you are reading something from the other side, you will never know if there's any possibility, maybe understanding exactly what they do believe because you get so polarized. I think this is the most dangerous thing we have because it's feeding right now our species the very worst possible way in the worst possible direction.